I know I'm repeating myself, but please do turn off your videos and your microphones as you join. Well, hello everybody. Welcome to the London School of Economics. I'm James Putzel and I'm Professor of Development Studies uh, in the Department of International Development here. Um, welcome to the first session in this year's uh, visiting lecture series at the school, Cutting Edge Issues in Development Thinking and Practice. We're doing this on Zoom and um, this, of course, everyone is getting used to. Uh, we often feel labored by it, but we found a silver lining in it. So this year's Cutting Edge series, which is taking place just as we approach the 30th anniversary of development studies at the LSE, this, this year's series is being broadcast around the world. COVID does allow us to do that, but even better, it allows us to get um, the most interesting speakers, thinking thinkers and practitioners from around the world to speak to us. And so we've turned what is a difficult time into what I hope will be very positive. And we have a, an extraordinary lineup for the series that will be happening every Friday afternoon um, between 4 p.m. and 5.30. Um, it's open um, on Zoom to the LSE community and being streamed to YouTube. I have to inform you the lecture is being recorded and um, when we move to question and answers, it will be on a closed Zoom uh, connection and it will not be recorded. So everybody is in a safe space here to have a great discussion. The series is happening in this time of pandemic, and the pandemic has exposed the fragilities of so many dimensions of our global system. Whether we're talking about the financial fragilities, we're talking about the effects of the environmental crisis, we're talking about the, the problems and fragilities in our global manufacturing, value chains and our global agricultural and food system. For developing countries, the impact is particularly severe. And it's severe because of the, the fragile position in which so many developing countries are incorporated into the global economy. The World Bank just um, a few days ago released a report uh, suggesting that there will could well be well over 100 million people falling below the absolute poverty line. And this shows also the problem of a neoliberal world where poverty reduction just brought people marginally above the poverty line in the face of these kinds of crises. And now the pandemic, people are, are, are falling right below it. Uh, Developing country debt is set to soar. We're going to see a big, a bigger debt crisis than anything since the 1930s going forward under almost every scenario. So the cutting edge series this year is, is uh, happening amidst all these challenges and the speakers that we have lined up um, coming from around the developing world will all be addressing uh, the challenges being faced um, um, for development in the South. We have Kate Rayworth who will be coming speaking about the environment. We have Branko Milanovic who will be coming and speaking about the global economy. Ha Jung Chang will be joining us later in the series. Jimmy Adesina joining us uh, to speak about social policy from, from South Africa. It's a very lively agenda and we hope that you can, you can see the poster for it behind me and you can visit our website uh, to check out the schedule. We hope to see you every Friday. Now, who better to start off this series than Jayati Ghosh? Jayati Ghosh is professor of economics at the Center for Economic Studies and Planning at the School of Social Sciences and JNU in Delhi. She's a scholar and an activist. 
she's written a raft of books and I can't take, I'll take all the time if I try to recount all of them. But I think about crisis and conquest in East Asia, the market that failed, the, about the neoliberal reforms in India. She's worked on gender. Um, she, looked, she wrote a book about the economics of, the, of neoliberalism and its effect on, on um, uh, women and women's work in globalizing India. The raft of her accomplishments is really quite uh, um, extraordinary. So we're so delighted that she's joining us today. Uh, just having arrived, left Delhi, and having arrived in the security and the quiet of Amherst, Massachusetts. Um, and I'm also delighted to welcome today uh, Professor John Harris, who's Professor Emeritus in International Studies at Simon Fraser University, joining us from Canada uh, as a discussant to Jayati's uh, talk. And it's, it's a special ple pleasure in this year when we approach the 30th anniversary of our Interdisciplinary Development Studies um, Department that we have the founder or one of the two founders of uh, Development Studies at the LSE with John here. So that, that's a great pleasure. So without further ado, I would like to turn the floor over to Jayati Ghosh or the screen. <laughs> Thank you so much, James. I, I feel so privileged to be introducing this series of lectures. It is such an amazing lineup and I look forward to joining you as well to listen to these speakers because it's, it's going to be a fascinating series. And I have to confess I'm slightly humbled at being the one starting this because uh, I know that the others who follow are going to have many more interesting things to say. Uh, what I have to say by contrast is really about one particular country only. But unfortunately, I think it might have lessons for others and it might have analogies that we can put for others as well. And uh, when I say unfortunately, this is because if you're looking at development policy, this is like a, a classic example perhaps of what not to do uh, in terms of a pandemic. And um, that's really, uh, going to be the focus of my discussion. So uh, have I shared the screen? Can you see the screen now? Yes, you have. And you, oh, might, just, you might just click on the presentation. Um, uh, I um, thought I did already. It's that little, uh, it's that little symbol at the I'm bottom sure. right. Um, oh, yes, you can do it that way too. OK. That's it. Oh, no, but, but it's showing all kinds of other things. Yeah, it's just, um, if, you, hmm. if you click on the very bottom of the screen, there's a little symbol of a projector just next, just to the left of the microphone. That's it. Yes, here we are. Okay, sorry sure. to be technologically challenged when I have no business to be in, in the circumstances when everyone is doing Zoom all the time, but here we go. Okay, so what I'm going to talk about is... Uh, how the Indian government has responded to the pandemic and what it has meant for uh, both the economy and the spread of the disease. And as you probably all know, uh, we had the most stringent and it turns out unprepared and unplanned lockdown in the world. Now there are many different trackers. There's one particular tracker which has put India at 100% in terms of the severity of the conditions that were imposed on the 23rd of March, which is when the national lockdown was imposed. Uh, but this particular one, which was uh, done slightly later, has put it at 86%, nonetheless, by far the highest among major economies and ma major countries. What's remarkable about this lockdown is that it was national. In the entire country, 1.3 billion, it was imposed within only four hours notice. So people were told that you're going to everything will be shut four hours from now without any preparation. And everything means all forms of transport, all shops, all establishments, all offices, all schools, all universities, all everything, all functioning things, except what were called essential goods and services. The trouble is it took about a week for essential goods and services to be defined. And so there was a lot of confusion even about 
the things that could stay open and many essential services therefore ended up closing at least for a significant period of time. For example, uh, only 30% of the Mondays, the markets for farmers were open uh, for about a month because there was actually confusion about what could be open and what was could not be. Uh, nobody knew other than the prime minister and presumably a small group uh, around him that it was going to be such an extensive and draconian lockdown at a time when we didn't really have too many cases, but nonetheless, it was the sharpest lockdown. Nonetheless, we've actually had a really terrible trajectory in terms of the course of the disease. This is interesting. This is, well, you can see the colored lines are the top three countries, if you want to call it top or bottom. I see you frozen. Bottom three, basically. Oh, can you hear me now? Yes. Uh, okay. Uh, is it stable now? Can you hear me? It is. Okay, Go good. Ahead. So I'm sorry. What I was saying is that uh, despite this lockdown, the trajectory of the disease has been one of continuous increase. Very, very sharp in the beginning, but it doesn't really slow down. There is no second wave because we're still really on the first wave, if you like. And we have now uh, exceeded both the United States and Brazil in terms of the average daily cases, uh, seven day average. This is remarkable. This means that the lockdown didn't really operate to suppress. Note that neither the United States nor Brazil had lockdowns of a similar kind over the early period. And uh, nonetheless, our trajectory of the spread of the disease has been continuing unabated. It's also worth noting that this was a lockdown that actually destroyed lives and livelihoods. It wasn't just that people were affected and in terms of losing jobs, losing the self-employed not having incomes, the informal workers losing access to work and so on. It was also that it was associated with extreme deprivation to the point of death. And what we see here, this is just covering it in the first month of the, the first two months of the lockdown, okay? But what you can see here is that there was a very large increase in the number of people who were dying for lockdown related reasons some for hunger and distress, some migrants who were trying to get home in desperation, who had ro faced road accidents, who died on the road and so on. Some who were beaten to death by police because they were disobeying lockdown rules. It was treated like a military curfew. Some who were denied access to medical facilities because of the lockdown. They could not reach places which they would normally have been able to reach and so on different kinds of suicide, different kinds of domestic violence that were exacerbated specifically by the lockdown. And this is an underestimation. There are other estimates that suggest that even by the middle of May, there were at least a thousand deaths just due to the lockdown alone. And of course, no surprises, economic activity declined very, very sharply. In fact, it actually collapsed. Uh, in the June quarter, that is the quarter ending uh, 30th of June, India was the worst performing. Again, this is an underestimate, the collapse in GDP, because it refers mainly to the formal sector. I will get to that. But if you look, whichever way you slice it, whether you look at it year on year or quarter on quarter, India was the worst performing in the period of the major lockdown, April to June. We don't really have the data on the subsequent quarter, but it's fairly obvious that India will be among the worst performing, even in the second quarter, because lockdown has been lifted only partially, and in many states it's still, there are still restrictions. But more than that, the blow that this economy received in this period, in April to June, was so severe that it's really going to take much, much more to get any kind of recovery back. So the economic situation is actually much worse than the official GDP data, which is what I've just presented. So first of all, remember that this is an underestimate. Why? Because our GDP, especially these quick estimates, 
are based only on data from formal enterprises. And it leaves out all of those informal unorganized activity, which constitutes a, or did constitute around 40% of GDP and about 85% of employment. All of that is actually just guessed at, or rather you look at the formal data and you say, I'm going to assume that the informal sector grew at the same rate. Also, we know that in the period of lockdown, even the formal enterprises, very few responded to the questionnaire that is sent out by the central statistical organization. And so actually only about 30% of the usual number of respondents responded. So it's a very, uh, shall we say, it's, it's, it's an underestimate. How much of an underestimate? Nobody knows. If you look at other kinds of data, people have estimated anything between 25 to 40% GDP decline in this quarter alone. But what is more uh, telling is that the employment response was even worse because the most uh, employment intensive sectors were in fact the worst affected. Construction immediately halted, uh, was allowed only from July. Retail trade collapsed, obviously. You're closing down all shops and establishments. Uh, hospitality services, tourism, travel, etc. all of that for obvious reasons all over the world, not just in India, fell very sharply. Agriculture showed an increase in employment. So everyone said, oh, agriculture will save us. That's ridiculous. What that meant was that people who could not find employment anywhere else, including returning migrants, went and worked on their family farms. So a lot of that is disguised unemployment. It's not an increase in employment in that sense. No surprises that nominal wages are falling. We don't have proper good data on the national wages, but ground reports from pretty much across the country are telling us that uh, the nominal wages are sometimes even half or one third of what they were before demonetization, not before the lockdown. I have to re remind you that this is an economy that was already in a very fragile state because of the terrible impact of demonetization four years ago, 2016 November, if you remember, was this extraordinary act of demonetizing 85% of the 86% of the currency. And it created, once again, devastation in the informal sector, followed by a very badly implemented GST, goods and services tax, which again attacked the informal sector. So while the informal sector was very badly affected, this didn't show immediately in the GDP data, partly, as I said, because we do not actually go out and survey them, and partly because the formal sector in the beginning took the advantage of this decline in the informal uh, enterprises to enter some of those markets. But over time, even the formal sector was affected. So we've had declining absolute investment, not just declining investment rates, declining absolute investment now for four years. We've had declining consumption. The uh, consumption data, the National Sample Survey, uh, well, the data were not released, but there is a leaked report which tells us that there was a 9% decline in consumption. Employment hugely affected even before this crisis. And of course, during the crisis, there was a collapse, unsurprisingly, in employment. In all of these, uh, we are now seeing that women workers have been disproportionately affected. They've lost employment disproportionately. Their wages have collapsed more. Uh, again, other socially marginal categories, uh, Dalits, scheduled tribes, Muslims, have also been worse affected. The government has been talking about a V-shaped recovery. And that's impossible it, because demand has collapsed. And I'll come back to this point later, but a demand collapse means that unless the government steps in to actually counter this collapse in demand, you're not going to get a V-shaped recovery. I'll come back to this point. So how did we end up in such a mess? How did we manage to do all these things that wrong? That is, we destroyed the economy, we didn't actually uh, manage to contain the disease, and we, we ended up with a, a situation of the worst possible world, it's a, a real dystopia, where you are not able to control the disease, and in fact, you were actually given up trying to control the disease at one level. And at the same time, you have an economy in absolute shambles in which there's no evident sign 
that there will be a recovery. And let's face it, until you control the disease any way, you won't get a real complete recovery. But there are also many economic policies that are required for a recovery, which are not happening either. So what went wrong? I have highlighted 10 aspects. I'm going to talk to, about all of them in more detail. So let me just quickly run through them for you to give you an idea. And then we will look at these in more detail. First, this adoption of containment strategies, which are just not suited to an Indian kind of social and economic context. Then the fact that it was extremely centralized, the response, the centralized national lockdown, which even China never did. China basically only did the state of Wuhan and then hotspots, Beijing when it happened, Shanghai when it happened and so on. Uh, without coordination, without taking on board the state governments, not using this lockdown time to prepare for the health, the health systems or investing in healthcare as you need to do, misplaced timing, I'm going to give you examples of that, very, very parsimonious relief measures. I mean, unbelievably parsimonious and uh, tiny uh, measures for relief. Overall, macroeconomically inadequate government spending to increase demand, as I told you, to counter this collapse in economic activity. And instead, a focus on just li easing liquidity, you know, allowing banks to give more credit, allowing them to extend moratoria on debt, that kind of thing, which hasn't really done the trick. Attempting instead to deal with the crisis by offering more SOPs, more neoliberal SOPs to private investment by saying we will relax rules and regulations, we will privatize some of our assets, so come and invest, please. I would argue that the, the social context has also been a major player. The fact that there have been very, very sharp class, caste and gender biases of the policy responses. And of course, it's been accompanied by a political disaster, by major suppression of information, suppression and repression of democratic rights and of human rights activists, a crackdown on dissent in general, an abuse of power to accuse innocent people of acts of inciting riots, when in fact, they were the ones who were doing the peaceful protests, a bunch of other things. And that I have, I'm going to argue, actually also operated to lower the possibility of dealing with the pandemic. So let's look at the first one, lockdown as the basic containment strategy. Now we know from the countries that have been successful, say New Zealand, Vietnam, and a bunch of others, even Pakistan has been better actually, but we know from the successful countries that the most effective strategy is testing as much as possible, as many people as possible, and as often as possible, tracing, the behavior and the contacts of those who have been tested positive, isolating those who have tested positive, treating patients who have got the disease. That's the only effective way of dealing with this disease. But this is expensive. This costs public resources. You cannot do this on the cheap. You have to spend the money to ensure everybody can test freely, to ensure that you trace the contacts, to make sure there are proper isolation procedures, which are themselves not unhealthy, and that there are proper treatment measures. This is expensive, right? So what was the option that the, this government chose? A national and very strict, as I mentioned, lockdown with major controls on mobility of all kinds. Not only did they stop road and rail traffic and car movements, but they even would not allow people to walk when they were desperate and had no option and were unable to have any food where they lived and were trying to get to their homes. Controls on social activity. And of course, this famous term social distancing, which I really heartily dislike. I, I would, it's much better described as physical distancing because that's what it is, right? It's maintaining a certain physical distance. Social distancing has too many echoes of something we're very good at in India. The social distancing that comes with the caste system and with other kinds of hierarchy and discrimination. Now, what's the problem with this strategy where you do all this physical distancing and, and you know, frequent hand washing and so on? It doesn't recognize the lived reality of most people in India. First of all, most workers are informal. They have no legal or social protection. If you remove their livelihood, they are going to be without any income. They have no other recourse. If you had a universal basic income, if you had 
you know, significant forms of protection which would kick in. If someone is denied the ability to work, they would get some income to tide them over, some minimum income during that period. If you had that kind of system, it could still be feasible, but you did not have it and you did not institute it. So people who were locked down basically had to rely on their past savings or on borrowing. And then eventually when both of those ran out to starve. In any case, if you look at the slums of India and in urban India where 40% of the people live, if you look at many of the rural areas where living quarters are still quite congested and cramped, physical distancing has no meaning. If there are five people living in one room and it's one room in a tenement where there are 10 rooms on the same little floor. It doesn't, you can't do it. It cannot happen. So this lack of recognition of the living realities, the fact that you know it's not so easy to get clean water, that the poorer you are, the more likely you are to have to buy water or walk long distances to collect it to and then carry it and then store it somewhere. All of these are expensive, whether in terms of human labor or actual money that the poor fork out. And so you can't just say, wash your hands frequently for 20 seconds and do this and do that, because it's not possible for most of the people. In such a context, telling people just stay at home and don't come out, it's unreasonable, it's oppressive, and you, you can't, it, because it can't be done, it becomes counterproductive. So that in fact, the very, the congested nature of life makes the, um, makes super spreading inevitable. If you do not accompany it, with testing, tracing, isolating. In fact, here I'd just like to mention the one success story we do have is the slum of Dharavi, the largest slum in Asia. It's in Mumbai. And there were some early COVID cases there. Dharavi managed to contain this spread of this disease essentially by testing, tracing, isolating, treating. It wasn't the lockdown that stopped the spread in Dharavi. It was basically this strategy. And of course, as I mentioned, you can't do the strategy without very, very extensive social protection, which we don't have and we did not institute. What do we have? Universal health coverage, it's a distant dream. We have a very poor public health system. Some states are much better than others. The state of Kerala is well known to have a much better public health system. Uh, but overall, it is hugely inadequate. The prime minister, Ja, um, this uh, Aro, Jan Arogya Yojana, or what is called Ayushman Bharat. It's basically a private insurance scheme, which is publicly funded. And that's terrible because it's the US model, if you like, the worst possible model where the government underwrites private insurance companies providing some kind of medical coverage to the poor. It's too limited. Far too little has anyway been spent on it. It's wrongly conceived because it's not expanding public health. It's relying only on private hospitalization strategies. And it has completely failed during the pandemic. It has been worse than useless. So even those who are eligible under Ayushman Bharat have really not been able to access facilities during this pandemic. And of course, at the moment, only about 10% of the population is even eligible. Then we have the fact that informal workers count for about 95% of our population, uh, workforce. Informal workers exist not only in the unorganized or informal sector, but also in the formal sector, in the form of casual workers, contract workers, people. These are people who do not have any legal rights. They don't have, uh, you know, the right to hire and fire is completely in the hands of the employer. They don't often have written contracts. They typically don't have any form of social security. More than half have no social security, even under public schemes, which are supposed to be universal. They don't get paid leave. They don't get any kinds of the usual things that come with formal employment. That's 95% of the workforce. In the private sector, it is more, but even the public sector is relying increasingly on this kind of informal employment. The, the public schemes that exist, I mentioned that there are some universal schemes, you know, like very tiny universal pension. The benefit is laughable. The national um, amount for the universal pension for people above 60 below the poverty line is 500 rupees per month. Okay, pathetic amount, which is inadequate to meet any kind of existence. There are other schemes like there is an, uh, an employer's social security fund, 
which in fact many workers pay into, but then they're unaware of the entitlements. It's supposed to be portable, but it isn't. Employers have no interest in informing them. Workers who lose their jobs, they lose. They, most workers actually end up seeing this as a tax on their income rather than as some form of social security. There was one major form of social security that came about in terms of food security, the National Food Security Act 2013. And this uh, built on the existing public distribution system, but it sought to make it a legal right, okay? Even this, it is supposed to cover 70% of the population, but it excludes around 170 million people since it was designed on a 2011-12 survey. And so around 120 deserving people have been left out of this scheme. So it has to be, uh, it, obviously they need to be included. But in addition, it essentially provides basic food, food grain, rice and wheat. So I see you Some frozen. Stage. Okay, is it all right now? Now it's good. We might have missed okay. the last sentence. Okay, uh, if you hold on a minute, I'm just going to make sure that all the other internet is off, okay? Just a sure. second, please. Thanks. Questions are occurring to the audience. Um, you can type them in the chat so that you don't have to remember everything you want to ask at the end, and we will be looking through them to ensure that when we do arrive at Q&A, uh, we'll be able to answer all your questions. I'm so sorry about that. My apologies. I hope it's better now. It's fine. Okay, great. Okay, so uh, the National Food Security Act was one of the few measures that actually did provide food access, and it was supposed to cover 70% of the population, but because it's based on a survey done in 2011-12, since then population has grown, a bunch of people were anyway left out who deserved it. But at the moment, at least 120 million people have been left out of this and do not have access to food rations. In addition, as I said, it doesn't provide anything beyond rice and wheat. Some states provide other items, edible oil, pulses, sugar, but most states use the national thing, which is just rice or wheat. And of course, then there is the employment guarantee, the Mahatma Gandhi National Rural Employment Guarantee. It is, in a sense, I mean, it's an employment program, it's a works program, but you can see it as a form of social protection in the absence of all other livelihood, at least it will give you some limited income. And I'm going to talk about that in a minute. Okay, so now let's look at the second feature of this response, which was that this is a government that was, it has been and continues to be a deeply centralizing government. It's actually destroying the federal system in the country. But it used the Disaster Management Act 2005 to impose the lockdown. And this act allows the central government to take any decisions in the face of a national disaster. And it doesn't have to consult anybody. It doesn't, it can override all other laws, rules, regulations, decisions of state governments. So it imposed a national lockdown with four hours notice without telling state governments. State governments were not even informed. They were just told that four hours from now, the railways will stop everything will stop, you will not get access to anything, you have to close your borders, you have to do the following. This lack of coordination and lack of consultation led to massive confusion, conflicting decisions, delays. I will talk about the, the testing kits and the ventilators, but one important thing we have to realize is that they centralized, but then they took no further responsibility. So having declared the lockdown, you would think that having declared it, you would say, well, all right, now I will do something to ensure that livelihoods are sustained. I will do something to ensure that essential services are still available, that basic goods are still provided. They didn't do that. They left everything to the state governments. Extraordinary, but true. State governments were literally left holding this enormous baby, enormous and ailing baby. And 
they were told you have to get the, arrange the tests, you have to arrange the health facilities, you have to make sure people obey the lockdown, you have to make sure that those who have lost incomes because of the lockdown are still surviving. It's all your problem. What did it mean? It meant that state governments are then trying to get testing kits there. Then the central government two months down say, no, no, wait, you cannot get the testing kits. I'll get them centralized. You buy them from me, but I will make a centralized purchase. So we buy testing kits from China. Turns out that they're faulty. So then the state governments get them. They're faulty. Then they're told to send them all back. The ones that they had ordered earlier, the order had been canceled. Then they have to reorder them. Consider the delays all of this involves. Interstate movements, the national railways stops. Okay, other than freight, but freight only of essential commodities. Define essential, who knows, where's the list? Of course, there's lots of gender issues in that one. I can tell you, for example, that um, sanitary napkins were not considered an essential commodity until a lot of outcry from women and so on. But there was complete confusion. Even today, we have air travel being badly affected because when the government decided to unlock, they said, now we're going to open up air travel. Early on, many states said we are not prepared. So the plane would fly into an airport. But then once you're in the airport, after the airport, you're in the state government's jurisdiction. So many state governments said, well, we won't let them out of the airport because we, until we know that they're COVID free, we're not going to let them in. There was complete chaos in terms of all of these movements. But perhaps the worst aspect of this centralization uh, without coordination or cooperation, I should say, was the fiscal centralization. State governments were made to bear the entire burden of dealing with the pandemic and the economic fallout without getting additional money. That's the amazing thing. Now, all of this will obviously require huge money, but state governments were really told, go ahead and do it. Go out there and spend. We are not really giving you anything more. In India, state governments have a hard budget constraint. They, uh, their borrowing is subject to the central government's permission, and they borrow typically on much more expensive terms than the central government. So it's bizarre that state governments were told you have to deal with all of these things. We are not giving you additional money. I'll tell you how much money they finally got if it will come. But you have to deal with everything. It's not our problem, even though it's a National Disaster Management Act. So part of this also, it reflects really bad planning and bad timing on the part of the government. On, uh, when the lockdown was imposed on the 23rd of March, there were 400 cases in the country, mostly in a few cities and in certain regions, okay? So you didn't really have to do a national lockdown. As I mentioned, in China, it was the state of Wuhan, the province of Wuhan that was completely locked down, not the rest of the country. And movements from and to Wuhan were regulated. And where then you had hotspots, you locked down that hotspot. But this lockdown in India extended over the entire country. That is the most extreme weapon you have. And you impose that first. And then you have no plan B for what if that fails. But of course, you cannot do a lockdown like this where you're stopping people from earning their livelihoods and giving them no compensation. I won't call it welfare, it's compensation because you denied them the ability to earn a livelihood. So you have to compensate. All of that uh, did not happen. So it created complete economic disaster. There was absolute devastation. Then the government started lifting. So we are having progressive unlocking, 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 when the chances of infection are much greater. It's absolutely the opposite way of doing it. The timing is completely stood on its head. These delays in terms of reaching relief also were particularly damaging for migrant workers. There are between 150 and maybe 180 million migrant workers, that is rural to urban migrants in India. Nobody knows the exact number, but it turns out that the central government has no idea about the migrant workers number either. They declared some small amounts of relief for them, but even a month afterwards, surveys found that most of them have received no public rations, no cash relief. 
nine out of 10 of them were not even paid by their own employers over this period. So they were basically starving uh, through this entire period. And that's why you got those terrible images that we all saw across the world of these people walking in desperation, families, old ladies, little children, 12 year old girl who walked for three days and died just a few hours away from her home, a, a pregnant woman giving birth on the road and then picking up that baby and walking. Uh, with migrant workers sleeping on railway tracks because you know they, they thought that would be safe since they thought there were no trains and being run over by freight trains. All kinds of human tragedies playing out. And of course, the other aspect of this is that you keep these workers in the confined and congested conditions in which they live. And then you send them out back to their homes eventually when you finally open up the trains for migrants six weeks after the lockdown starts. And that reverse migration then spreads more disease. So it's it completely bizarre. Now, oh dear, I'm taking too long. Let me hasten. The, the lockdown period should have been used to prepare health infrastructure, personnel, facilities, but it wasn't. How much was provided? The first relief package Less than 0.04% of GDP was for public health spending. Can you imagine? That was the increase provided for dealing with this major pandemic that you think is so major that you have shut down the entire country. And of that money, of that 15,000 crore that was set aside, only 40% has actually been distributed by among the states, even today. Six months down the line, only 40% of that has been distributed. Instead, what happened, the Prime Minister announced a new PM Cares Fund. And everybody was coerced or persuaded into paying money, donating for this national pandemic into the PM Cares Fund. Uh, public sector agencies, all public employees, big business, everybody paid into PM Cares Fund, which also got tax benefit and so on. It turns out that the PM Cares Fund is not a public entity. They have refused to give any information under the Right to Information Act on the grounds that it's a private entity run by the prime minister and four other cabinet ministers, but in their private capacity. It's extraordinary because you go to any public website and on the opening homepage, you will see an advertisement for PM Cares Fund and donating to it. They have refused to release any evidence of the amount of money they've spent. They have received around 10,000 crore at least the state governments have been saying, give that money to us, we are desperate. Instead, the 15,000 crore that was promised has been taken in the form of loans from the ADB and the Asia Infrastructure Bank. And as I said, even that money has not been spent. That's why testing rates are below the global average. We're not following up by tracing, tracing contacts. We can't even blame the states because they don't have the money. Migrants are causing rural spread in places with very poor infrastructure. Health workers are underpaid. In many cases, they're unpaid. We have had health workers, doctors, nurses, other workers going on strike because they haven't received salaries for months. Typically, they don't get protective gear. And of course, another major health aspect, the neglect of other diseases. TB is the major killer or was the major killer in India before COVID. TB has been utterly neglected, 40% less deliveries in institutional conditions of babies being delivered, child immunization rates have fallen dramatically. So the medium term implications of the health disaster neglect are going to be very, very severe. The relief packages were completely inadequate. This, the first uh, official relief package, which was uh, four days after the lockdown was announced, provided new spending of only 0.5% of GDP. Then uh, a month later, the prime minister announced a very big program, Atma Nirbhar Bharat, Self-Reliant India, which claimed it was going to provide 10% of GDP. But if you broke it down, the new spending, which included the early stimulus, the early relief measures, the new spending was less than 1.5% of GDP. And even that hasn't been spent. That's the shocker. Even that small amount has not been spent. The most appalling is actually the food distribution, because India actually has very large amounts of buffer stocks with the Food Corporation of India, which 
procures food grain from farmers and then distributes into the public distribution system. At the start of the lockdown, we had 77 million tons of food grain when the buffer norm is for 24 million tons. So way in excess, we could have distributed 50 million tons free easily. Because by the way, it also costs money to hold this, these stocks. So you could easily have distributed. They did not, they distributed little trickles. So that then they, they collected more than the rabi harvest. By August, they had more than a hundred million tons. We have been hoarding grain. And a lot of this grain is probably now unfit for human consumption because they, they have the capacity to store only 75 million. The rest of it must be lying in temporary places, in open areas where rats can get at it. Only 2.2 million tons of free food, so-called free, was distributed to the states even one month after the announcement that they were going to give five kilograms per household. And many more people have gone hungry or starved to death. The big lifeline has been the employment guarantee because in fact, it's supposed to be a demand-driven program. If it functions correctly, it would automatically increase when more people demand work. But of course, it's also affected by the fact that the central government doesn't release money for it. In April, employment in this scheme fell by 83% compared to the previous year. It collapsed at precisely the time when you needed it most. And that's also because of confusion about the lockdown. There was an increase in the following month, but thereafter there was a budgetary squeeze and states were starved of funds to run the program. At the moment, in fact, many states are running out of the money. And this is only by the middle of August, but nonetheless, many states were already running out of money. Many households had already completed 100 days of employment, which is the limit. So you really have to expand it to 200 days. There's still no work. There's still no incomes, no livelihood available. You have to extend it to 200 days at the very least. And government can do that without changing the law. It can automatically do this. Ideally, it should be extended to all adults, which will require changing the law. This government can change many laws. It has changed all kinds of laws in the last one month. But this one, it doesn't change. The overall fiscal stimulus has been completely inadequate. As I mentioned, there's such a dramatic collapse in demand, okay? Consumers have just, are unable to spend, stop spending. Uh, employ, the investors are not investing because there's no market. So the government has to counter this and it has to counter this directly by providing food and incomes to those who need it and indirectly by enabling the revival of these micro, small and medium enterprises. And of course, it also has to spend to ensure that there's an adequate supply of necessities because a lot of supply chains have been broken in this process. But it has been remarkably modest or stingy in its spending. And this is really because of the fear of financial markets and fiscal conservatism. They have completely internalized the Washington consensus that you simply cannot run fiscal deficits in any conditions. The irony is that the less you spend now, the larger your fiscal deficit will be. Because when you spend less now, the economic activity will fall further, your tax collections will fall. And so even with lower expenditure, your deficit will be larger. And your deficit to GDP ratio will be larger because GDP will fall as well. We have this peculiar situation where households, private investments, and government, they're all contributing to GDP decline. Just to give you an idea, I don't know if this shows you, but this is looking at the period from April to July. Our financial year begins in April. So the first four months of the financial year, which is the period of the pandemic, the lockdown and everything, and then the first unlocking. And of course, receipts came down, but expenditure is only marginally above what it was in the previous year. It should have been double if you're talking about that kind of thing. If you look at it in more detail, you look the only major place where there is an increase is agriculture and rural development. The rural development part is because of the employment guarantee, health and family welfare, the increase is so marginal that it's barely keeping pace with inflation. And transfers to states increased only because they finally paid the dues that were they had to pay the previous year. That's the only reason. Otherwise, states didn't actually get much of an increase. These were dues that were meant to go to the states in the previous financial year. 
So what's happened to fiscal federalism? It's been a disaster. As I mentioned, states have been made responsible for everything and for health matters and for social protection and for the economic fallout, but they have hard budget constraints. So what did they do? They front ended all their spending. They basically took their whole annual budget and spent it in the first four months to cope with the pandemic. And some of them are now reaching that limit. So they're saying, how do we even pay salaries in the next few months? The, incredibly, the central government is saying, we owe you 44,000 crore in terms of GST compensation. There was a formula whereby GST uh, revenues were supposed to increase by 14% every year. If they didn't, the center promised to make up that shortfall for five years. This is the third year. They're saying, no, we won't pay it. Can't pay, won't pay. So the center is telling the states, you go and borrow at higher interest rates and you deal with it. So we are giving you permission to borrow. Now, the states pay higher interest rates than the center, and they have no revenue raising powers. They gave that up in GST. So how will they ever repay? Only by cutting back on spending in the next year. It's absolutely bizarre. As I mentioned, instead of doing a required fiscal policy, the central bank has basically provided credit guarantees. It's extended loan moratoria, which is really kicking the can down the road. And it's a can that gets bigger and bigger because all it does is allow you not to pay your interest this month, but the interest gets added on to your existing loan. So what you're doing is creating a larger problem later on down the line. And even the credit guarantees and the access to loans that was promised, these have not reached the MSMEs, the small, medium and micro enterprises, which are still credit starved. Obviously, the big companies who can borrow are saying, well, what do I invest in? I'm not, my capacity utilization is 30% or 40%. Why should I invest? Why should I expand capacity? What should be done instead is more public spending. The RBI should, through monetized deficits, lend to central and state governments at the base rate. That, that is, it's not rocket science. Every other country is doing it. But for some reason, the Indian government refuses. Instead, they are trying to incentivize private investment with a whole slew of new neoliberal reforms. The deregulation of agricultural markets through three farm bills, which is actually basically going to leave farmers at the mercy of big global corporate buyers. And there have already been fairly large farmers protests in several states, despite the lockdown and the repression. There are all kinds of incentives now for fossil fuel extraction, and especially in the coal sector of all places. So this is going to add to our other problems. They have reduced environmental regulations. They've got rid of a range of environmental controls, thinking to attract private investment in a very, very short term way. They are pushing labor reform to allow unhealthy and unsafe work conditions in the belief that this will somehow attract more investors. They are opening up more public sector enterprises to privatization, whereas these public sector enterprises could be actually used for economic revival. And they're opening up banking and retail trade to foreign investors. There's even in the Atma Nirbhar package, uh, a claim that they're going to allow private involvement in space exploration. Finally, I just want to get to some of the other concerns uh, which have affected the pandemic response the caste, class, and gender bias of policies. Uh, I already told you how the prevention measures themselves have a deeply middle class or elite orientation, that you can do physical distancing, that you do have access to water and all of that. This refusal to re release food grain for the hungry, that this is so obscene that I don't even want to talk about it too much because it, it makes you so angry. But people have been starving to death and there are endless cases and reportage of denial of food grain to the hungry. As the grain is accumulating, being wasted, some of the stock is now being sold in the open market and converted into ethanol for hand sanitizers instead of actually being used to feed people because anyway, a lot of it is now no longer fit for human consumption. But there are other aspects of the class bias, the, the transport facilities, for example. Indians abroad got special flights, Vande Bharat flights, they were called, and they were assisted to return home and so on. Migrant workers inside India 
all transport stopped. If you were desperate and starving and just wanted to walk back to your village, you were denied transport, you were thrashed, you were punished, you were sprayed with, uh, with disinfectant, you were locked into rooms, all, all kinds of things for, because you were supposed to be maintaining curfew. I've talked about how women were disproportionately affected by the lockdown. This is a global phenomenon, the increase in domestic abuse, but in India also disproportionately in the job losses. And of course, the caste practices. As I mentioned, social distancing is something we've been doing in India for a very long time. But in, the, in this pandemic, the treatment of frontline workers in care and sanitation has been appalling. Not only are they denied physical protection and often minimum wages or any kind of increase in incentives, but they have been shunned and treated badly by society as large, at large because of the possibilities of infection. So it's, it's really been quite horrifying. And of course, the fact of information suppression and the crackdown on dissent. The data on COVID is very unreliable. It's increasingly manipulated. Many deaths are not reported as COVID deaths. We are not being given data on total deaths so that we would at least know how many excess deaths there are in this period compared to the previous year. None of that is being provided. There's complete lack of transparency. Reporters who have exposed particular aspects of treatment or policy who have been covering the pandemic, they have been threatened, some have been arrested in different states. And of course, the pandemic was a remarkably convenient way to crack down on all of dissent. If you remember before that, there was a, an outburst of public peaceful protest across the country with all these peaceful sit-ins, Shaheen Bagh and many other peaceful sitting sit-ins of women. Immediately on public health grounds, all of these were removed. And thereafter, all the peaceful protesters and other dissenters have been targeted, intimidated, arrested, jailed, kept in COVID infested prisons. Many of my students are in these prisons. My colleagues, my friends are being arrested. And some of these patients have actually been infected by COVID in the prison and still they are maintained and kept and incarcerated. I think we're the only country in the world that has communalized the virus, blaming Muslims for its spread because of one particular event. When at the, they were unlucky, it was an event to, when, when the lockdown was not fully enforced. There were many other Hindu gatherings. It just so happened that there wasn't a COVID infected person at one of those gatherings. But it has been widely communalized. And all this sowing of division and this absence of public trust and social solidarity you know, you can't control the virus without this. And so it's actually hugely undermining our capacity to control. So how do we do? What do we do now? We have to have a much bigger role for social protection. I would argue that's the most immediate requirement. So for heaven's sake, pay the state governments their pending compensation dues, provide much more money because they are the ones dealing with the pandemic and its effects universalize the public distribution system. Just give anybody who wants it 10 kilograms per household per month. Don't ask for an Aadhaar card. Don't ask for your ration card. Don't ask for anything. People who need, we have enough grain at this point. Just provide it for six months free. Provide compensation to families because they lost incomes during this lockdown. You stop them from earning income. Provide at least less than the minimum wage, 7,000 per family for three months as a compensation. I mentioned doubling the number of days of employment on the employment guarantee to 200. Start an urban employment guarantee. Some state governments are already talking about it, but they don't have the money. Convert the debt moratorium into a standstill. That is, you don't require interest payments for this period. I find it extraordinary that you can say everything else stops, but interest payments go on. Finance keeps getting paid. Why? If everything has stopped, finance also can have a standstill for that period and massively increase the dedicated resources for health, for all the pandemic required spending and other health concerns, as I mentioned, that have been ignored. The point is, and I, I want to emphasize this last point, I'm sorry I have spoken for longer than I intended, that all of this obviously will reduce poverty, it will reduce inequality, it will create a more healthy and productive workforce. But macroeconomically, this is the point that we need a counter cyclical buffer. We have to stabilize income and demand. We are collapsing, we're falling down a tube. We have to stop that collapse. And it's only public spending 
that can stop that collapse. And we have seen that countries that have large or even reasonable social protection systems in place have had less severe declines in economic activity. Whereas the money will say, there's no money. That's not true. Immediately, you have to just spend it. You can monetize the deficit. Governments across the world are doing it. It will not be inflationary if you maintain essential supplies because demand is so low. Eventually, as the economy recovers, there are other ways of raising revenues. Wealth taxes, taxes on MNCs. There's an estimate that you just have to tax 965 families in India, only 965, 4% of their wealth, one off, and you get 1% of GDP. Okay, that would double your health spending. Public health spending could double with just 965 families, 4% of their wealth pre pandemic. Their wealth has actually increased during the pandemic. Multinational companies evade taxes because of shifting their profits to low, jurisd low tax jurisdictions. Tax them on a unitary basis. Say our share of your sales or your users or employment is this much. I'm going to tax your global profits at 25%. It can be done. It's only the ideological blinkers that are preventing us. But essentially, the critical point is this. If you don't spend now, even just with deficit financing, the economy will be declining further, reducing incomes, and taxes will fall, and the fiscal deficit will be lower. OK, sorry for speaking for so long, but let me end here. I feel you did not use all your time. It was oh, wonderful. Oh, really? Oh, good. <laughs> all right, then. <laughs> that was fantastic. Okay. And thank you so much. Now, how do I stop sharing it? Wait, you just click sharing. on that oh, yeah. green. There we that go. Green yes. arrow. There you yes, go. Yes, we're back. Yes. Okay. Yes. Very good. Now I invite my old friend, dear friend, John Harris, to offer us his commentary. John, you'll have to unmute your mic and put on your camera. <laughs> I think I, I think yeah. I've done that, James. Yes. Uh, okay. Perfect. Right. Well, uh, as always, Jayati, it's been a great pleasure listening to you, and that was. Uh, I, I hope everybody's aware of what an exceptionally lucid and comprehensive analysis uh, you have presented in, uh, as James said, a little bit less than your uh, allotted time. But I also say what a relief it is that you are safe. I, I guess that uh, some of those listening may not be aware of the threats that you have been subjected to in the recent past. Uh, or really aware uh, of your courage. Uh, you're not alone in this, of course, but your courage in continuing to speak out uh, against this, uh, this regime in th this extraordinary climate of fear, which has been created uh, in, uh, in, in India. Um, I, uh, I, I I don't know whether you uh, follow this, but uh, the, there's the Varieties of Democracy report, which is published every year by a team at the University of Gothenburg in Sweden. And in their 2020 uh, report, uh, they said of India, India is on the verge of losing its status as a democracy due to the severe shrinking of space for the media, civil society and the opposition uh, under Prime Minister Modi's government. Um, I, I think it's li there's little doubt that when we come to the 2021 uh, report of, of the Varieties of Democracy project, uh, they will not be saying that uh, uh, India is on the verge of losing its status as a democracy. Tragically, sadly, it will quite clearly not be amongst the democracies uh, of, the, of the world. You've been so comprehensive uh, that, uh, you know, there's <laughs> it's not a lot for me to say, really. Uh, so I'm just going to, to sort of really emphasize uh, what seemed to me to be uh, some of the major points. Um, and I'm perhaps thinking more of the, uh, of the sort of the politics of, of this uh, than of the, uh, than of, if you will, of the, the, the economics. Um, I think what strikes me above all um, is, in a sense, the sheer callousness uh, of uh, the way in which this government has uh, operated in the context of the pandemic uh, 
uh, and the way in which its response has been so strongly class biased. I, the, the class bias was put rather nicely uh, in a, an article early on uh, of uh, uh, the commentator Pratap Mehta's in, uh, in the Indian Express when he said, we, and he was referring to the middle classes, we were given more time to prepare for the banging of utensils than migrant labor was given to reach home. Of course, he was talking about the, the bit of political theater that, uh, that Modi uh, set up on, what was it, March the 22nd, I think, the day of the so-called janitor curfew uh, before the, the major lockdown started, when at five o'clock in the evening, everybody was asked to come out onto their balconies and bang utensils and, uh, uh, and, and, and so on. Um, people were given a lot of warning about that. Migrant workers were given no warning at all um, that they were going to just lose their livelihoods um, and have no means uh, of, uh, of going home. Um, I think you did say this, but uh, I think it's important to, uh, to emphasize just what a very important share of the Indian labor force is actually made up by migrant workers. Quite a lot of them, of course, are relatively short distance migrants, but many are long distance interstate migrants. And as long distance interstate migrants, they are effectively disenfranchised and uh, have historically uh, had no right, for example, to PDS, even if they, even if they, uh, they hold uh, a, a, a ration card. Migrant workers probably make up something like a quarter uh, of the uh, of, of the labor force, um, so we're talking about a, a you know a, a vast number of uh, of people, and those who sought to uh, to get home in the context of the lock the lockdown, according to one authority uh, on migration in India, actually created what was probably the biggest population movement in history since he believes that more people were on the move uh, in the context of the lockdown than moved uh, at the time of, uh, of partition uh, in, in 1947. As you said, uh, migrant workers trying to get home were subject to ex sometimes quite extraordinary brutality uh, on, the, on the part of the, of, of the police. Um, and the provision made by government um, for those who lost their livelihoods uh, was utterly, uh, utterly inadequate and has continued to be utterly inadequate. Extraordinary callousness uh, and an extraordinary class bias. Yet what I think is quite, is, is really very striking um, and, and I think deserves to come into our, our, our discussion today is how this has been uh, received by so many people. I saw many uh, newspaper reports, reports by journalists of conversations with migrant workers actually saying, uh, the prime minister Modi, he had to do it. Uh, he's, he's looking after us. And the polling evidence for what it's worth suggested uh, in May, uh, this year that, you know, 82% of, of, uh, of Indians, you know, according to the survey evidence, approved of the job that Modi was doing. And it's, of course, as we all know, not unusual for political leaders in the context of crisis uh, to, uh, to attract increased support from, from people. Um, Mr. Johnson in England received more, more approval immediately after the onset of the, of the lockdown. But the extent of, of Modi's approval was really quite extraordinary. And I think it, 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 it poses questions about, about how it is that, uh, that this regime uh, is able to, to maintain such, such strong support in spite of the, uh, of the disasters over which it has presided. You mentioned demonetization, you mentioned uh, the, uh, the 
sort of crisis that was caused by the way in which the, uh, the new GST was introduced. Um, so many people suffered from these events. And yet, uh, it seems from the evidence that the great majority of people believed that these, uh, uh, these actions were taken in their interest. You know, this was saving the people from, uh, from pernicious, pernicious elites. Now, uh, the lockdown and its consequences seem to have been received very generally in the same sort of way. The strong man was do has been doing it for us. How brave he's been, you know? This, this sort of stuff. Where is the opposition? Um, yes, there are brave people like you and our friends, Jay and you and, and elsewhere, who continue to criticize, but mobilized opposition, well, it's, it's here and there, but um, yeah. And, uh, and this, I think, the, the further points I, I want to emphasize uh, you know, just drawing on, on what you have said, really is to emphasize the ways in which uh, this, this government has used the pandemic to further its agenda. It's used the pandemic to further the Hindu majoritarian agenda by the way in which it has been able in this context to clamp down on, on opposition. We see this, I think, in... Uh, uh, an evil but farcical form in the, uh, this very, very long report of the Delhi police on responsibility uh, for the, uh, the events in Delhi uh, in, uh, in February, when um, uh, activists you know, like yourself and your students are held as being you know, responsible for terrorist, terrorist action. And those who uh, members of the ruling party who actively encouraged people to take the law, uh, to behave in, uh, to undertake vigilante actions against protesters, escape absolutely scot-free. So the government has used the pandemic to further its Hindu majoritarian agenda. Secondly, it seems to me that the government, and you brought this out very clearly, has used the pandemic uh, to uh, accelerate its agenda of centralization. I think I'm right in saying, I hope I'm right in saying, uh, that the RSS has always uh, favored, uh, a high, thought that India should be a centralized, not a federal state. And I think we, we see this agenda being pushed in the way in which the center has treated the states uh, in the context of the, uh, uh, of, the, of the pandemic. It's a very, very dangerous course though, it seems to me, because when you add you know, the, the tensions that have been enhanced through the actions of the central government in the context of the pandemic, add that to the long run, uh, the implications of long, long run demographic trends, you know, which are going to see more and more people uh, in the Hindi heartland states and potentially the Hindi heartland states having greater political cl clout than ever. What are the implications of this going to be for the, the unity uh, of, the, of the country? And lastly, and I'll very soon stop James, because I think I'm running up against uh, limits of my time, um, just to emphasize, as you have done, uh, how the government has used the circumstances of the pandemic to extend its uh, right-wing uh, neoliberal, or I would say market fundamentalist uh, uh, agenda. Um, emphasizing fiscal discipline, of course, um, uh, uh, using this moment to bring about the deregulation of agricultural marketing uh, and supposedly, you know, to open up agricultural markets uh, to private capital. 
And then the way in which the moment of the pandemic has been used, not sure that you did uh, emphasize this point, to bring about major changes uh, in the legislation relating to labor. Of course, several states very early on in the pandemic used the moment to effectively eliminate um, uh, labor laws uh, and to uh, remove virtually all the legislation uh, that protects uh, labor, um, okay, supposedly just for a short period. Um, but that was really the harbinger uh, of the, uh, the introduction of the new, the new labor codes, which you know, greatly reduce uh, the security uh, and, the, and the rights of, uh, of labor. Um, so um, thank you so much for such a, uh, a, 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 an extraordinary, um, yeah, account of, of what has, uh, has happened. Um, I just hope, uh, of course, that the measures that you advocate at the end um, may be taken up, but I fear that I don't see this regime taking them up. Thank, Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And for both of you, I wish I had this sound of applause I could broadcast. <laughs> um, uh, and just before, I would just like to um, conclude with our live streaming to the outside of the LSC, um, thanking our speaker Jayati Ghosh for kicking off our series in such a wonderful way. And John Harris, welcome back to the LSE. And thank you for your insightful reactions and comments. And so I, I urge everybody who's watching this um, internationally and outside the school to tune in next Friday. And I urge our own students, I can already see lots of questions in the chat, um, to stay on and talk with our speaker and our discussant. Um, and thank you very much. So just as we're